you both go into more depth on what you did for tendon strength? It's been mentioned on the okay. podcast before that you did push down sets of 100 plus with bands to keep triceps from tearing. You want to go first, Dave? Or? Well, I guess I can go first. Um, I really didn't worry a whole lot about my tendons until one actually popped off. <laughs> then I started to become really Too concerned late. about it. And um, essentially, there's, I guess, three ways that I know that helped with my tendon strength. One was ultra, ultra high repetitions, trying to use the least amount of muscle force as I possibly could. So mm -hmm. a high rep reverse band press, like JM was talking about for, that he used as a strength builder. If I zeroed out that bar and did that revert just did the regular bench press to where the bar is essentially zero so the band can actually pull me through the full range but then did a hundred repetitions with that the first time i would try that my triceps would start burning at 60 reps which meant i was contracting too much i was contracting too hard the muscle was doing too much work the blood flow wasn't going to get to the tendons as much as what i wanted it to so I would have to focus on only pushing with a couple pounds that are necessary to move the bar to get the repetitions to 100. That's a little more complicated, but that's what worked the best for my pec tendons. For elbows, the tricep banded pushdowns worked because you're essentially taking the eccentric away as long as you're not resisting. And you can push those up to 100, 150, 200 and recover the next day have no soreness at all if there's soreness you did it wrong high rep ultra high repetitions are one way the other way would be isometrics done for short pulses say three to five second pulses with no weight so and with that you have to still cover the full range of motion that of the i'm speaking powerlifting. so for me the bench press was the most problematic so i would have to hit three different spots to be able to cover plus or minus 10 degrees each one for just five seconds we're not talking a lot of time here just five seconds five with, seconds is a long time to do yeah but it's, it's, it's a gradual increase though you yeah. gradually because i didn't want to jump on my elbows you know some people will smash oh you mean in the, uh, i understand what you're so saying so it's now. a slow yep it's a slow build up so that so maybe flex one into the isometric yes so flex maybe one out. second okay. is is real and yeah. that might be once every couple of weeks because that's a lot harder to recover from than what people think it is then the third way is super heavy loads and that's in nature part of training for the meat so being a conjugate person i had the super heavy loads with different exercises every single week which were helping to develop you know bone density and the tension and i was able in the tendons but i was able to recover from it because the movement was changing every single week now it can be debated if there was any type of dynamic correspondence from those lifts to the lifts that were actually done on the platform that's where different training methodologies and philosophies come in um, but that's also very very hard to recover from so what i'm trying to say is i used all three in different ways and then would pull back the more riskier ones the closer the meat came because the closer the meat came it's not that i became more paranoid it's the risk increases even more because the t the time is it's like high the movie high noon it's like the time is getting near. Yeah. Do I really need to be doing this isometric work right now no. when I can just do banded push downs? No, you do not. No. You know, so boom, they get pulled out. Yeah. And but I did do all three different variations because I didn't want to ever adapt completely to one. And these aren't things that I wanted to use progressive overload on because that's gonna it's going to require for the banded pushdowns a heavier band. It's going to be really hard to not have that contraction that I'm trying to avoid because a, a tendon is really hard to get blood into. Very, very hard. So those are the only ways. And even the, the single reps aren't really putting blood in the tension. It's just bu building the stability around the joint to be able to keep all the structure from allowing that tendon to actually blow up.
And managing weight, I guess that's another one. You don't want to gain too much weight too fast the last week before a meet because now all of a sudden you're in a your all your muscles are just you know the glycogen's just blowing the muscle apart and then when you go to flex that's even more torque what well, changes the angle yeah it changes the angle that you're, you're yeah so there there is going to be some variance that's that's the nature of the beast that's the nature of the sport but you don't have to put on 25 pounds two days before the meet <laughs> i'll let you go with well i i uh i'm going to end up with uh the first thing you mentioned with trying to get load to the tendon without the muscle so i'll come back to that last and i'll just say uh heavy loads absolutely build tendon strength mm -hmm. so it, it follows what's called wolf's law of bone but but uh bone is a connective tissue so and, and connective tissues are cartilage and all type three and four cartilage three and four car, uh, collagen fibers in the ligaments and tendons so load them up you know but load them up safely you know if they're getting hot they're getting inflamed you're doing too much if you've ever had something called a, a golgi tendon reflex you'll know it because you <clears throat> you begin to take a weight up and you literally cannot control it it just the muscles just shut off and the weight falls. It's not like you, you feel it go. It just, you think you're gonna make it. You're on your fourth rep or something and you've been, you've been overtraining these, uh, these muscles. So what happens is there's a little, uh, they call it a Golgi tendon organ and it's connected to a nerve which is connected to your spinal cord which does not go up your brain. It's a reflex. It goes to the cord and back to the muscle. So it's, it's, in the, it's in the tendon, but it goes back to the muscle. And it's there as a protective mechanism so that if there's too much uh, tension, it, it measures tension. If there's too much, and the muscle spindles do this too, but this is the tendon we're talking about. So if there's too much tension on the tendon and it, it, it senses a distortion, it'll send this nervous impulse to your spinal cord, which comes back to your muscles, which are causing the tension and tells them, cut it out. And it shuts them down. You can't keep trying because you're already sending the signal to contract. Well, it subverts that and it cuts in and they just drop. So if you've ever felt that where you, you didn't get tired or you didn't, it just quit on you and you don't know, I couldn't, couldn't even explain it. That was the Golgi tendon and you're in danger of rupturing it because it's it's been inflamed you've kept training and now there's too much load on there and it thinks maybe it's gonna so it's trying to save you and if it doesn't flex fast enough you can tear it a common exercise just to kind of help people see what you're talking about is a close grip bench press for reps is a pretty good example of what you're talking about because you just be trucking away and then bam done but this you is know, this is a little different than little fatigue. Different. Yeah, yeah. This isn't a build. But up it's of, the same stopping, except now if you haven't had it, it's it's a shock. You're you're moving fine, and then the bar falls. I got you it. go soft. Okay. You don't just get tired and yeah. run out like hit a wall. It's not hit a wall type of stop. Mm -hmm. It's I'm going up. Boom! Mm -hmm. It just fell on me, and you're you're shocked. Mm -hmm. Because you were sending a signal, and every time you send a signal, you get some contraction. Well, not this time, because you're not sending a signal. The Golgi tendon organ goes to the spinal cord, mm -hmm. comes back to the muscle, and says no. Mm -hmm. And it falls, it drops, and it's dangerous in itself, because you've got weight, mm -hmm. but it doesn't want to rip that tendon. So it, it, it's sort of a protective mechanism. And there's another one with the muscle spindle. But so, if you're in that position where you're, you're getting your tendons lit up, by the loads it's time to back off and you can't you can't build them anymore you have to just let them catch up mm -hmm. but if you can so loading them heavy loads the, the best way to build tendon strength period there's nothing better then uh, secondly you said isometrics which is a great way to build tendon strength because it, it, you have a huge amount of tension on the tendon and it responds to tension. As I was going to say that about Wolf's Law. Wolf's Law of bone is where, wherever the more tension there is, the bone will thicken up, or the cartilage will thicken up, or the ligament will thicken up. It responds to tension. 
So if you put more tension on something, it will thicken up. If it's a bone, if it's a ligament, if it's a tendon. So it responds to that ten tension. So you can create huge tension with no weight by just flexing isometrically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's an outstanding way. But that doesn't address your first point, which was how do we, how do we load the tendon but not the muscle? Well, it's actually, it's actually impossible, but... How about this? Let's think this through. See what you think. I did an exercise that I adapted from uh, a high rep exercise that uh, when, I don't know if you remember this, but when the, when the Swiss balls mm -hmm. made their way to Westside, George and Kenny and, and Lou were doing these dumbbell presses on them. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. And they were kind of bouncing them off the bottom mm -hmm. and getting these high reps, but they would do a hold, a static hold, an isometric. So I adapted that in this way. I got on the ball and I fatigued the muscles with high repetitions, okay? Then I let all of the slack, I, I, I let the stretch happen as deeply as I can on my, my pec tendon. So when we're talking about the tendon, we're talking about this one. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I let, I let that just stretch and I would hold it there for two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. After, after being in that position for five minutes, guess what happens? The muscle's exhausted. It relaxes. It can't hold it. And you're, if you keep it there, it's pretty much shifted over to the tendon. So now you get that time of tension not on the muscle because it's exhausted and it's stretched, and you already put it in a stretch position. And I thought that, I, I, don't, I don't have any science behind that, but I thought that was a good way to, you had to fatigue it first. Yeah, it's a it's a but, loaded stretch. But then you, know, you under fatigue. Then you can relax the muscle, and it's pretty safe. I will say this though: it's a, a couple times the um, brachial plexus got lit up from the stretch. Yeah, well, you were probably long, using 150 pound dumbbells, or I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure you were using great dumbbells. I came from the mud, desert on my hands.